All right, praise the Lord. It's good to be in the house of the Lord. Another time, David said, I was glad when they said unto me, let us go into the house of the Lord. Are you glad to be in the house of the Lord today? Amen. Praise the Lord. Amen. Amen. It's a blessing that we can come together in the house of the Lord. We are going to continue our series uh, today. Uh, we are doing a series, Black History with a Cutting Edge. And uh, we are in the month of February. This is 2019. And we are commemorating, we are celebrating all of our ancestors, all of our ancestors that came out of Africa, those who were kidnapped by Europeans. And some people don't like me to use those words. Some people are very uncomfortable when I use those words. Our ancestors that were kidnapped by Europeans, shackled, put into the, the bottom of ships and uh, brought over here to America, to the, to the Americas, not just America, all over the Americas. And uh, according to a um, historical record, more than two million, more than two million of our brothers and our sisters, they died during their journey from Africa. It is called the Middle Passage. More than two million black people during that time, they have, they, some people think maybe close to a thousand ships bringing people over here to the Americas died on the Middle Passage. And not mentioning how many people who were killed during the time that they were raiding. They were going into different villages and they raided these villages and they're taking people into slavery. And also we want to honor all of those people, all of those that were killed during the time of the raid on those villages, those who died uh, on the journey from Africa to the Americas, the Middle Passage. We want to give them, we want to celebrate them. Also our brethren, all of our brethren in the States, those who are lynched, those who are hanged, those who are burned. And we are not leaving out you know, our mothers and our sisters who are raped by the white man. All of these people, we want to honor them and we want to celebrate them. And this is not anything for us to feel uncomfortable about. The, these things that I'm talking about, it's, it's all documented. Amen. It's all in, 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 in historical uh, books that is out there. So we don't have to be afraid, you know, when we talk about these things. So what I want us to do before we go further, let us all stand and we're going to have a moment of silence as we commemorate our ancestors. Okay, praise the Lord. All right, glory to God. I'm going to take you right back where we left off last week. I know, you know, some people might be a little bit uncomfortable when they hear about some of these things that we're talking about when we're dealing with black history. And uh, I say, you know, last week we talked about some stuff that was very uncomfortable. And some of these things that we mentioned last week, you know, uh, I know it can upset your stomach when you hear about some of these wickedness and atrocities that was done to our ancestors. But you know, if anybody is going to look into the history of black people, if you're going to look into the history of slavery, you have to go with a strong heart and a strong mind. Yeah. Because I want to let you know there is no good news. When you when you look into the history of slavery, there is no good news. Some people will say, well, Pastor Lucas, why, why don't you tell us something good? There is nothing good to talk about. When you talk about slavery, there is nothing, there's no good news. And when you look into the history and you, 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 you're looking up uh, the, the history of slavery, all you're seeing is people being kidnapped, people being shackled, people being put into uh, ships, sailing over to the Americas. All you can see is people being lynched over in the United States, some people being burned, you see, they're reading about uh, people who are beaten. People, uh, uh, when you look on their backs, all of this is documented. And you see all of that, if you go on the internet and you look these things up, you'll see the kind of uh, 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 abuse that was handed out to our people. So when we are talking about, when we're talking about black history, there's no good news. There's no good news. 
news about black history. All you've seen is about our people being raped, our young women and our mothers being raped, our young boys being raped, and all of these kind of things. All of these things is recorded in, in black history. Even when you think about uh, the abolition of slavery, somebody will say, well, you know, talk about the abolition. That is something good to talk about. That might be good news. There was no, there was no good news when uh, the British, the British, uh, Great Britain, as they call it back there, when they um, come up with the idea of the proclamation to abolish slavery, there was nothing, there was no good news about it. You know, when you, when you look at it, they set a date for the abolition of slavery, and when that day come, I could imagine that, you know, our ancestors back there, especially those people down in the Caribbean, they were celebrating and rejoicing. Oh, we are free at last. No, they wasn't free at last. You know what happened? When they did that pro uh, proclamation that slavery was going to be abolished, what they did, they, they did give the proclamation. But what they did, they said that the slave who they just set free, they have to work 12 years. They call it indentorship. They have to work 10, 12 years on the same plantation, under the same old white slave master, so that they can be trained. They have to work for 12 years for free. They said freedom, but they have to work for 12 years for free under the old slave masters so that they can be trained how they are to live in society. So what are you telling me? What kind of good news? There's no good news that we can really talk about. All we can talk about is the truth, the hard truth. All of the different things that happened to our people during the time of slavery. So I'm going to pick up right there again, and uh, <laughs> I'm going to talk about you know what was going on in Barbados during that time. In Barbados, the British established one of the first modern slave society, and what this is saying is that that was the first modern slave society that was set up in Barbados by the British. And what was happening here? Everything that was going on, the whole economy in Barbados was built on slavery. And what was happening is that at that time, it is believed that they probably have about 30 to 40,000 British people, white people living in Barbados at that time. And at that time they had, uh, I think it was about 380,000 slaves, black African slaves that these people were depending on. And what was happening is that these people, uh, the white people using all of these African people to build themselves up. The whole economy was built on slavery. Right. And uh, back in that time in Barbados, they passed a law. The British rulers passed a law, and what they say in this law, any slave that come into Barbados will have to be remain slave for life. There is no chance to ever be coming free. And they extend the law and they said that even the children that was born from these slaves have to be slave for life. So there was no good news. There was no good news that we can talk about. And, you know, slavery has certainly been practiced in many parts of the world since ancient times, but never before had a territory, a, a, a territory entire um, economy being based on slave labor for capital industry. So this whole industry, all of Barbados at that time, was built on slavery. These people just working, these um, Africans, and uh, you know, in Barbados at the time, they had close to 600, 600 plantations. They had 600 plantations more than 600 plantation that was in Barbados at the time. Beginning in the 1627, uh, in 1627, the enslaved were put, were put to work in intense cultivation of sugar cane. We all know what sugar cane is all about. You know, the, 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 you know it's so hard to go through a sugar cane field. In some places they have to burn the field before they can cut it. Working in chain gangs in shift that covered a 24 hour period. What was happening here is that the British and people like the Portuguese and the Spanish and the French 
and the Americans and all of these people who were heavily involved in slavery. What they will do, they will take their ships and they will go down to Africa. They go down to Africa because as we studied last week, it was a, 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 a three-way uh, trip they were, that they were operating, triangular trip. And they will go down to Africa, they had guns, and they have ammunition, and they have rum. Take alcohol, and they take uh, all these guns and ammunition, and they exchange it for slaves, and they will bring back these slaves to the Americas, bring them back, put them, drop some in the States, maybe they go down to the Caribbean, go down to places like Brazil, or Haiti, or Barbados, and they will take up sugar cane from those places, or whatever the slave produce in those places, they will load up the ships and they will go back to Europe and sell these things in Europe and you know make uh, money, tens of money off of these people. And this thing didn't just operate during the time of slavery. I remember when I was growing up in St. Vincent. I can't remember, I can't, I can't forget this. In St. Vincent, the price of banana, I remember sometimes the price of banana will go down to uh, sometimes half a cent, sometimes one cent, sometimes cent and a half. And uh, the British people, Great Britain, will send on ships, send on their boat, down in St. Vincent and places like Grenada and I think uh, Dominica and Jamaica. Send down their boat down there, load up their boat with um, bananas, you know, buying bananas at you know, such a low rate from these people. And they will go to um, England and go to other places and sell it for, for big bucks. Continue making money off of, you know, people. So, um, you know, but never before had the territory, uh, entire economy been based on slave labor for capital industry. Beginning in 1627, the enslaved were put uh, to work in intense cultivation of sugarcane, working in chain gangs in shift that cover a 24 hour period. So they have them in chain gangs and they're working in a 24 hour cycle. So as I was saying, they go down to Africa and they take down the guns and the ammunition and the rum and they load up the ship with slaves and they come up in, you know, to um, the Americas, go to places like Barbados, places like Jamaica, Cuba and all these places and Haiti. And what they'll do, they'll sell these uh, slaves to their people, the white people who are living in those areas. And these people will set up plantations. And on those plantations, we have all of those African people working in a 24-hour um, cycle. In one of the greatest experiments in human terror the world has ever seen or known, slavery was not a good thing. And as I was saying before, there's no good news. Our people suffer. Yeah. And we are not to be afraid to talk about, you know, the suffering of our people. And I know some people might be uncomfortable and say, well, Pastor Duncan, if you talk about these things, or when you talk about these things, white people are not going to come to our church. White people are not going to come to our church anyway. Yeah. White people only go to black people's church when they're, somebody invites them to stay for a child, to become the godparents of a child. But different than that, you don't see white people uh, going under a le the leadership of any uh, black pastors. It's only we as black people who, we will go to a, a white church, and we will pay our tithes to a white church, and we don't feel any way about it. Look at the church right across the street here, um, Prayer Palace. The majority of the people going there is black people, and it's a white family that is running that church for, for years. So I'm not afraid, you know, I don't have nothing to hold back. The truth is the truth, and the truth is gonna set you free. So they set up these plantations, and they have these um, African people working in a 24-hour cycle, working on these um, plantations. They have it set up uh, in, play in the Caribbean, South America, and Southern United States. Fear and torture were used to drive black workers to cut, mill, boil, and, and clay the sugar cane. So they on these plantations, and what they're doing, they're using um, fear and, and, and torture. They're using fear and torture to get these people to work. 
and you know they want them to produce more so they are using torture they're using fear you know they want to get more work out of you and you have your, your kids they're going to threaten you you know in Barbados I'm, I'm going to send I'm going to send your child over to a next plantation you are living on this side of the island but I'm going to take your son I'm going to take your daughter or I'm going to take your husband and I'm going to sell him to another um, slave master on the other side of the island. That is going to drive fear into anybody. So therefore, you don't want your son to be sold. So therefore, even though you are already working hard, you're going to work harder. So he had this, the, the slave master had this over the slave all the time. Amen. So it could be shipped. So they have to, um, they have to work on these, uh, the sugar cane, they have to mill it, they have to boil it, they have to clay it, have, so that you know, it could come to um, perfection. So it could be shipped to Britain as part of the lucrative triangular trade between the west coast of Africa, the Americas, and Britain. The trade in slave and the goods they were forced to uh, produce, sugar, tobacco, and eventually cotton, uh, you know, uh, Sorry, let me go over again. The trade in slave and the goods they were forced to produce, sugar, tobacco, and eventually cotton, created the first lords of modern capitalism. So what the writer is saying here is that lots of people, ordinary people, British people who went down to Barbados and those other places, they set themselves up and they become multi-millionaire in no time at all. Off of all of these uh, plantations that were set up, in places like Barbados. What is the average lifespan of a slave? If you guys have any question that you'd like to ask, you can just, you know, raise your hand and I'll, I'll um, stop and let you ask your question. I'm just kind of getting excited when I go over these things. You know, what is the average lifespan of a slave? It was said <laughs> to be about 30 years. The average lifespan of a slave, it was said to be about 30 years. When these people work during the day, they already work a 24 hour shift cycle. From the time, you know, um, the sun rises, they are up and they are not leaving the field until it's dark. And then when they leave the field and they go back to their quarters, they still have to continue working. They have to go back and they have to feed the chickens. They have to feed the pigs. They have to carry water, go and bring water to water the animals. And uh, then they have to go and they have to pick. They have to uh, clean the cotton. Cotton was a hard thing to clean. And this thing was done after they finished their 24 um, hour shift. They have to come back to their quarters and have, they have to do all of these things. So because of that, they were working them to death. And these people must have lived a long time. The most they were living, some, most of them is up to 30 years. You know, however, it, it, you know, it all depends on the nature and the, the danger of the work that these slaves were being forced to do. The slaves in the rice field were more likely to, to, to die sooner from mosquitoes and other infection. Slaves who work in tobacco field had a much uh, longer lifespan due to the fact that tobacco was not a big money crop. So the owners of the plantation had to treat the slave better in order to keep them happy and multiply. You know, because tobacco, you know, wasn't producing a whole lot at that time, these slaves, they probably used to get a little bit better treatment than those who are working in other um, places on, on other plantation. Now, uh, why did the trade begin in America? Or when was it, when, when did the trade begin in America? When did slavery start in America? Slavery in America started in 1619, when a Dutch ship uh, brought 20 African slaves ashore in the British colony of Jamestown, Virginia. And it is said that these 20 Africans that was uh, brought into Jamestown, they were sold for food. They exchanged them for food, and uh, the first uh, European to arrive on the coast of Guinea were the Portuguese. 
the first European to actually buy enslaved Africans in the region of Guinea was Anton Gonzalez, a Portuguese explorer in 1441. So here we see that the Portuguese, they are the first set of people who went into Africa and started taking out slaves. And then yesterday I was looking up and looking at the Portugal and seeing how small Portugal is. It's a small little strip of land. Portugal is connected to France. And when you see how small Portugal and France and these places are, and then you see the amount of places that they colonize, you ask yourself the question, how come these people are able to do these things? And the answer is that the Catholic Church, the Roman Catholic Church was behind Portugal and Spain. The Pope at that time put their blessing on the Portuguese and on Spain. They said to Portugal and Spain, go out and colonize, and you go out and you enslave people. And because of that, you know, because back in those days, the, the Catholic Church was more powerful than now. And they were, they, they were fully supporting, you know, the, the, these people. Amen. So, you know, um, expanding European empire in the new world lacked one major resource. A workforce. They didn't have a workforce. They expanded, but they didn't have a workforce. More, in most cases, the indigenous people had proven unreliable. Talking about the indigenous people, it is the Indian people, the native people that they found in all of those places that they say they discovered. Most of them were dying from diseases brought over from Europe. And Europeans were unsuitable to the, the, uh, the climate and suffer under tropical diseases. So even the Europeans, they can't handle uh, the climate, they can't work in that kind of condition. The settlers found that the indigenous Indians, at least those who hadn't been wiped out by imported diseases, were neither numerous or resilient enough to provide the labor required. You know, the European came in, and uh, these um, Indians, native Indians that was there, they wasn't strong enough. They wasn't strong enough to handle the work. And after that, the diseases that the Europeans came in with, it was killing all these people. And when you talk about diseases, you're talking about smallpox. And you're talking about the deadly uh, germs that these people came in with. Much of the credit for uh, European military success in the New World can be handed to the superiority of their weapons. Yes, they have the big fire stick. You know what a fire stick is? That big cannon that they use. They have the long gun and they have the sword. Even uh, the fact that they had unique load-bearing mammals like horses, they came in with the horses. You know, these factors combined give the European a massive advantage. They have guns and they have ammunition and they have horses and all of these things. These things give them uh, an advantage. But weapons alone can't account for the breathtaking speed with which the native population of, new, uh, of the new world were completely wiped out. The native population, when these people came in with all of these diseases, I don't know if they deliberately brought in these diseases to kill all these people, but the, the native people, their, their body didn't have the resistance. Native people, north and south, were displaced, died of diseases, and were killed by Europeans uh, through slavery, rape, and war. In 1491, about 145 million indigenous people lived in the Western Hemisphere. By 1691, the population of the Native American had declined by 90 to 95 percent, or by around 130 million people. So what they say in that short space of time, after the European people came in, 130 million Native uh, people who were in the land, you know, when these people came in, died from different sicknesses and diseases. Scholars now believe that um, the widespread epidemic diseases 
to which these natives have no prior exposure or resistance was the primary cause of the massive uh, population decline of the Native Americans. So, where does this deadly disease come from? And why was it linked to Europe? They're giving us the answer here. For thousands of years, the people of Europe lived in close proximity to the largest variety of domestic mammals in the world. They live close. They're living on farms and they have all of these animals. They're eating and they're drinking and they're breeding in the germs. These animals bore over time animal infection cross species, evolving into new strains which become deadly to men. Diseases like smallpox, influenza, and you know, measles were in fact the deadly inheritance of the European farming tradition, the product of thousands of years spent farming livestock. So what they said is that these diseases, the native people they didn't know anything about it. You know, uh, diseases like smallpox, influenza, measles, and all that, it was new to uh, the native people. And as I said, I don't know if they deliberately planned these diseases to get rid of these people, because it happened in such a short space of time uh, more than 130 million people died from uh, these diseases. In the era of global conquest, which followed, European colonizers uh, were assisted around the world by the germs which they carry. So it's not just the guns that they were using to kill people, but the diseases that they came with assist them in getting rid of the native people. More victims of colonization were killed by the European drones than by the guns or the sword, making drones the deadliest agent of conquest. Amen. Now, I just want to talk a little bit here about the Aborigines people in Australia. After, you know, European settlers arrived in Australia, as I was explaining last week, excuse me, As I was explaining last week, you know, the way how the British were able to colonize Australia, because the British, they had 13 colonies in, uh, you know, before the United States was formed. They had 13 colonies over there. And uh, these 13 colonies, because the British tried to um, put heavy taxation on those 13 colonies, the 13 colonies, they resisted. and. Uh, um, there was a, a, a war, there was a, a revolutionary war uh, against Britain and all those colonies and I think France and you know um, Spain and I think the Dutch, they came in to fight so it was a big war that was going on. So they end up kicking the British out and the British, they lost control of their 13 colonies. So the British, what they were doing when they had these colonies, they used to take all of their criminals same thing that they were doing in Barbados. They take their criminals from England and they ship them down to Barbados or they ship them over to, over to the 13 colonies that they have in the States. So now they didn't have any, they didn't have control over those 13 colonies because they get kicked out, you know, from the United States. So they decided they were going to colonize Australia. The Aborigines people, they've been living there for hundreds of years. They're going to colonize Australia because they want to use Australia to put all of their criminals. And what they did, they went in there uh, in Australia in 1788. Thousands of Aborigines people died from diseases. Major outbreak of smallpox killed large number of native Australians. There was a strong circumstantial case supporting the theory that someone deliberately, I said deliberately, introduced smallpox in the Aboriginal uh, population. Uh, colonists sy uh, systematically killed many others. At first counter, there was over 250,000 Aborigines Australians, uh, Australian. There is a list of 250 massacres of native Australian. So they have documentation. 
where these British people, 250 massacres that they have, fighting against these people. These people, I guess all they have is, you know, a little bit of boil arrow or, or stuff like that. But the British going with their big guns and they're killing all these people. The, uh, the, the massacre ended in 1920, leaving more than 60,000, only 60,000 from the 250,000 people that was there remained when uh, the British finished their massacre that was going on in Australia. Let me just go back to what I was talking about. All right. <clears throat> Okay, we talk again about the Portuguese. The Portuguese had a solution. So what we say is that when the Europeans came over, uh, the Indian people who are uh, occupying the land, they didn't have the resistance to fight against the diseases. They couldn't uh, do the work, and the white people they couldn't do the work either. And they were looking for a solution. And the Portuguese people, because they are custom trading and slave in uh, Africa, because when you look on the map, you see. Uh, Portugal is very close to Africa and they're able to, you know, just go down to Africa and pick up um, slaves. They used to take slaves from Africa and take them back to um, Europe. When the sailors first established trading link with coastal West Africa, they found an existing African slave system that could be uh, turned to their advantage. So, you know, slavery was going on in Africa uh, before they start trading and slaves, the Portuguese. Because uh, the Arab people and the Muslim people, the black Arabs, the black Muslim, they used to sell, you know, other um, African people to um, um, Europe. And uh, uh, the, the, the Portuguese, they used that at their advantage. Africans, on the other hand, were excellent workers. So these native people, they couldn't handle the hard work, the strain. They were uh, Africans were excellent workers. They often had experience of agriculture and keeping cattle. They were used to tropical climate, resistance to tropical diseases, and they could work very hard. You hear that? They could work very hard on a uh, plantation or in mines. The transatlantic slave trade began during the 15th century when Portugal, Portugal again, that small little place that had the blessing of the Pope, had the blessing of the Catholic Church, and subsequently other European kingdoms were finally able to expand overseas and reach Africa. The Portuguese force began to kidnap people from the west coast of Africa and to uh, take those they enslaved back to Europe. So here we see what this writer is saying is that the um, European people, they finally was able to expand and to leave Europe and to go over to Africa. And what is happening here is that uh, for a long time, the people in Europe, they were starving. For a long time, the people in Europe, they were dying of different diseases. When you look up the history of Europe, you'll see how many times when disease come in, you have the, 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 the black death the, 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 that came in, and different diseases that came in. Thousands upon thousands of people dying out, people sick, people hungry, people starving, and they finally recover. Instead, they give God thanks and try to live in peace with other people. What they did, they go over to Africa and start to enslave people. When sugar plantation, <clears throat> Introduced to Brazil required a cheap source of labor. The Portuguese settled, settlers looked not to the native Indians, but across the Atlantic to the slave they could easily ship from Africa. Slowly but surely, as larger boats carried bigger cargoes back to Europe and returned with even larger quantities of slaves, Africans become the labor force of choice. They want the Africans because the Africans, they are strong. Yeah. And the abundance of fertile land in Brazil, European capital and the influx of cheap uh, slaves combined to produce vast quantities of sugar, a commodity in great demand in Europe, and one that yield 
phenomenal wealth. You see the sugar cane and all of these products that these slaves were producing in the Caribbean and in America. It brought enormous wealth to um, all of these people to become wealthy yeah. overnight. And I just want to read out you know, some of these uh, lists that I have here to you. I have a, a, a list here of most of the, the countries or some of the countries that was involved in the slave trade. And as you talk about the wealth, that the, the phenomenal wealth that these countries make, you know, and what they have, you know, today. And when you look at places, countries that exploit black people during the time of slavery, when you look at the United States, it is said that the United States presently have 17.3 million millionaires right now in the United States. Maybe have more. Do you think that slavery have anything to do with uh, these people in America today that enjoying all of that wealth? 17.3 million millionaires in America. The United Kingdom, Great Britain, number of millionaires, 2 million, 225,000 millionaires in Great Britain. How do you think some of these people, don't you think that some of these uh, money that was made during the time of slavery passed down from father to son, go down from one generation to the next? A lot of these lands that these white people have over in the states, it was land that was given to their family during the time of slavery. And some of them still have that land today. During the time of slavery, the um, United States government, every six slave that a white person had, they promised to give them 600 acres of land. And some of these people still occupy some of these places today. Places like France, number of millionaire in France, 1,617,000 millionaire in France. In Spain, France was one of those countries that was involved in the slave trade. Yeah. And the reason why there are so many millionaire in France, in the United States, in Britain, I think it had a strong connection to the slave trade. In Spain, there are currently 428,000 millionaire, millionaires in Spain. Spain was one of the, 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 the leading slave trading country also. Portugal currently had around 94,000 millionaires in Portugal. I think it is connected to slavery. The Netherlands, number of millionaires, 287,000. The Netherlands also play a leading role during the time of slavery. Belgium, number of millionaires, 307,000 people in Belgium uh, that are millionaires. When you look up the history of Belgium and you see how the country of Belgium, how they colonized the Congo and they called the Congo the Free Congo State and they went into the Congo, King Leopold went into the Congo and he take over the Congo and he called it the Free Congo State. And then he went in there and they discovered um, rubber. You know, at that time, you know, um, tires for vehicles was in great demand and they discovered rubber in the Congo. And uh, King Leopold with all of his soldiers went in there and they started to abuse those people in the Congo. And what they did, they would hold them hostage and they would demand that they go out and they will bring in a certain amount of that liquid to make the rubber. And if they will bring it in, they will take their, their sons and their daughters. Sometimes they will cut off their hands, cut off their feet, and do them all these kind of things, hold their wives hostage. All of these things happen, you know, um, during the time when uh, Belgium took over, take control of um, the Congo. Australia, we just mentioned Australia. How many, how much billionaire in Australia? Australia have one million, just over a million people in Australia that are millionaires. How much, how much of the Aboriginal people you think is millionaires today? And they were the first settlers, first people settled in Australia. The British people go into Australia and they colonize Australia, they take away the land from the black people that was over there. The Aboriginal people, they are black people. 
they took away the land and they took away the title to the land. They said all of the land belongs to the crown. And these people, they don't own anything. Amen. Then even we can even talk about Italy. Italy, I don't think they were so heavily involved in uh, slave trading. But the Italians, they tried to take over Ethiopia. And they tried to colonize Ethiopia, but they couldn't. Yeah. Because the Ethiopians, they resist them. And they drive them into the sea. You know, and uh, during that time, it was two African countries that didn't get colonized. It was the Ethi uh, Ethiopians, Ethiopia, and Liberia. Because Liberia was formed when free slaves, slaves that was free in the United States, they go over to Africa and they set up a country for themselves. So they didn't get to colonize these people. So what I'm saying, all of these countries that I just mentioned here, and all of these millionaires that we have in these places, and I think I, I, I jump over one. <laughs> you know, I jump over Canada. Good old Canada. Canada that you know try we try to say that Canada wasn't involved in the slave trade, but next week God's willing, we're gonna we gonna get Canada involvement in the slave trade. In Canada, our uh, number of millionaires is one million one hundred and seventeen thousand millionaires we have in Canada. And all of that I think is a spillover from the slave that they were keeping here. Because even in this good old Canada, some of the politicians, members of parliament and all of these high people in society, they all keep in slaves. Yeah. Amen. So uh, let's go back to, to what we're talking about. Amen. European uh, <laughs> enslavement of Africans brought devastation and depopulation of Africa, but contribute to the wealth and the development of Europe. And that is so true. You know, I remember when I was in school, as soon as you get a teacher in school that can, you know, teach math or a good English teacher, you will hear um, somebody say they're taking people to go to England. And England want the best. The best, the most educated people they have in those small islands. Grenada, St. Vincent, Dominica, England want them. And they're taking the best. The best will go to Canada. And then you want to start all over again. And these places just trying to develop themselves. The, the British people continue to do wickedness to people that they had enslaved for over 400 years. I remember I was reading, it was right after the Second World War. When the Second World War was ended, um, Britain was devastated. I think the Germans bomb a lot of places in Great Britain. Right. And Great Britain, they want people to rebuild. So who do you think they're going to turn to? Okay, they turn to the slaves. They, 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 they own the people who they were enslaving. They turn into them. What did they send down a ship down to Jamaica? Good old Jamaica. <laughs> they send down a, a ship down in Jamaica. They call it the, the Windrush. And they have what they call the Windrush Generation. And they set up a, set up a ship into Jamaica to pick up these people who they once enslaved because they need them now. They need a people to rebuild. They need hard workers. Yeah. So they send down this ship down in Jamaica. And these Jamaicans, they pay their passage. I think it was 24 pounds, I think, if I remember correctly, for the, the fare to go to England on this ship. And you know, when they reach up in England and uh, you see these Jamaicans, some of them walking for weeks with their suitcase on their shoulder. Nobody that rented them. They have, they have space in their homes. White people in England have space in their homes, but they don't want black people in their house. So these people, they have to walk for weeks before they can find a place that they can live. And this happened, I think it started out somewhere in 1946, 48, somewhere around there, when this um, ship came down and take these Jamaicans and take them to uh, Great Britain. And they're up there for almost 80 years. And it's just a few years ago, they started deporting some of these people, people who went there so long, their children that born in Great Britain, they said that they have no citizenship. 
And some of these people that went up there who is alive, you know, this time, they say they don't have no citizenship. Yeah. Some of them even served in the army. Yeah. And Great Britain telling them they don't have no citizenship. Yeah. And the thing is, they have other nations and races of people that go to Britain at the, around the same time. And that didn't apply to them. They have full citizenship. But the black people that came out from Jamaica, who um, worked so hard in Great Britain, they are there for more than 75 years. They're telling them that they don't have citizenship. And they, de they deport so much of them back to Jamaica. I think this thing is still going on. I don't think it's fully settled. The Spanish enthusiastically adopted similar system in the Caribbean colonies as did the British in Barbados and Jamaica. So the Spanish was doing the same thing that the British was doing. And it's all of these Gentile nations that came into Africa and taken advantage of God's people. In North America too, where uh, tobacco become the most important crop. The supply of cheap African slave become vital to the uh, economic growth. For 200 years, um, from 1440 to 1640, Portugal had a monopoly on the export of slaves from Africa. It is notable that they were also the last country to abolish the institution. Although, like France, it still continued to work farmers, uh, former slaves, as contract laborers. So what is happening here? After slavery was abolished, in all of these colonies that was owned by France and uh, the Portuguese, they, can, they can't work the land themselves. These people can't do the work themselves. They need the slaves. So after slavery was abolished, what they did, they um, sublet, or uh, in America they call it uh, sharecropping, where they give these people the land to work. And when the crop come in, the white man will come in and he will take what he want, and he will sell and take whatever money he wants. And they continue to do this to these people even after uh, when slavery was abolished. Now, it said here, in the history of the transatlantic slave trade from 1525 to 1866, 12.5 12 mil 12 million Africans were kidnapped and shipped to the New World. <laughs> Of them, 10.7 million survived. So, as I said this morning, it is close to 2 million people who died during the journey from Africa to come to the Americas, which they call the Middle Passage, the dreaded Middle Passage. Um, disembarking in North America, the Caribbean, and South America, only about 388,000 were transported directly from Africa to North America. So what they say is that it is only 388,000 black Africans that actually land in America itself. All of those other uh, people that came out from Africa, they go to places like Brazil, Barbados, even Barbados, Barbados at one time had more slaves than America. At one time, Barbados had more than close to 400,000 slaves on that little island. Barbados had more than 600 uh, plantation, and you know, and uh, you know, <laughs> these people were just abusing uh, the, the the people of God, you know, and uh, the importation of slave into the United States was banned by Congress under constitutional command in 1808. So what is happening here? The United States Congress, they passed a law that they were gonna ban slavery. And that was done in 1808. And what was happening here is that these people, the slave owners, the slave masters in the United States, they work it out and they figure it out that Bringing slaves from Africa is expensive and they're not making enough money in it. So they decided to change the rules. They're going to start bringing slaves in America. Instead of going over to Africa and bringing the slaves over, they're going to um, stop the importation of slaves. So what they did, 
they get, um, you know, um, they talk to the Congress. Because racism starts from where on the top, you know. It's not just the little ordinary white folks in America was racist. Those men who were making the laws, they also was racist. And uh, they, they, they have their own slave. I think one of those presidents, I can't remember his name right now, he had eight children with one of his slaves. Amen. So the, these men up in uh, the government in the uh, United States Congress, they decide and they were in agreement with these slave owners that they should ban the importation of slaves from Africa. It is not because they want to cancel or abolish slavery. They are looking in a way in which they are going to make more money because when they have to send a ship over to Africa, load that ship up with slaves, and so many people dying, you know, during the journey from Africa to America, they figure out that they're not making enough money. So what they did, they passed this law in 1808 that they're going to stop, um, cancel the importation of slaves. And yet, by 1860, they canceled in 1808, but yet by 1860, the nation black population had jumped from 400,000 to 4.4 million, of which 3.9 million was slaves. Reason why this big jump is because of slave breeding. They start breeding slaves in America. And what was happening is that in the, in the US, on average, a slave mother give birth to between nine and 10 children, twice as many in the West Indies. And what they're saying is that by the time these girls 13, 14 years, slave master breeding them, they will have um, studs yeah. on different uh, plantation. You are a white uh, slave master, you have a plantation, and you don't have any studs, you take your young uh, winches, as they call them, a rip, winch, and they will take their winches and they will take them over to a plantation where they have a stud, and uh, this stud will, will, will breed that young girl or how much he have, if he have two or three um, young girls that he want, uh, this stud to breed, he will just, or uh, how many studs is available. They will breed these young girls, and then he will bring them back to his plantation. And they have this slave breeding thing that was going on. And sometimes before these young girls could reach, you know, by the time they're in their middle twenties, some of them already have eight or nine, ten children, because they're using them for that purpose. 40% of the Southern free Negro population were classified as mulattoes, while only one slave in 10 had some white ancestry. The average reason massa were more likely to free uh, slaves who look like, and in many cases, descended from them. So all of these mulattoes, the whole mulatto race of people, came out from black people, yes. is when the, the white master raped he himself. He don't look for stud. He himself go and he raped the, um, the, the, the black woman, raped our sisters, raped our mothers. And from that relationship, we have the mulatto race of people. And what the slave master was doing, he will quicker, he will more inclined to free the mulatto, the half-white um, son or the half-white daughter because these children, the white people didn't like them, the black people didn't receive them, they were in no man's land, nobody didn't want them <laughs> because they were massa children, <laughs> you know, but they are all people, yeah. amen, <laughs> praise the Lord. You know, the middle passage referred to the transatlantic slave trade, a second middle passage followed within the U.S. between the end of the Revolutionary War and the start of the Civil War. So what they say is that there is two middle passage. You have the first one when they kidnapped our ancestors, packed them into those ships. And by the way, those ships that brought over the slave, according to what I was reading last night, 
These ships, they were only the bottom, down in the belly of the ship was only about three feet high. Only three feet high, so the slave couldn't stand up. They had to lie down and they would chain them down. And there's so many of them that died, you know, from starvation, died from the heat and the smell, you know, because those ships were like slaughterhouses. And there, there, there's this African slave that was uh, kidnapped from Africa, you know, um, um, I can't remember his name right now. Equiano Aquiano, I think his name is. Orlando, Orlando Aquiano is his name. He was kidnapped from Africa when he was 11 years old. And what this guy said, he gave his testimony. He was in England, he'd become a very educated man. And uh, he said that he was at home with his, his sister. And they came in and they kidnapped him. And for seven months, he'd taken seven months from where his house was before he could get to the, uh, the, 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 the ship that they were going to put him on. Seven months. That is the reason why I'm saying that there are so many people who die in Africa. When they pick them up, it takes them so long to take them to where the ship was. So many children. Could you imagine that? You pick up a mother with two or three children, and these children can't keep up. What is it going to happen to them? They die. So what this guy said is that he was at home, and the, these people came in, and they captured him and his sister. It took them seven months before they reached the place where the ship was docked. And they put them on the ship. And the first thing they did, they beat him. Severely beat him, almost killed him. 11 year old boy. And then they put him in the hole of the ship. And the hole of the ship is smelly because these ships carrying human beings for such a long time. I guess these people, they will, you know, go off. They will be uh, urinating and they will be putting all of their businesses in the hole of the ship. It's a smelly, stinky place. And sometimes the, the journey, the middle passage, is going to take sometimes two months before they reach into the United States. He gave his testimony. And all of this was taking place. So we're talking about um, uh, the reason. Uh, uh, we're talking about um, the, the, yes, the second middle passage. I know it's a lot that we have here to cover. And I'm going to take a little bit more, a little bit more of your time because tomorrow is a holiday, so uh, you don't have to hurry to go to work. So I'm going to take a little bit of your time. So we are talking about the um, second middle passage. The first middle passage, it was when they kidnapped our ancestors, put them into ships, these smelly, stinky ships, and they brought them over to the Americas, sold them, put them on plantation, and these things to work. But there's a second middle passage. And this second middle passage is because they have the invention of what they call the cotton gin. Cotton, at one time in the world, in the United States, becomes so important. They used to say cotton is king. And back in the day, before they invent the cotton gin, the slave, one slave, they used to take one slave, one slave could have only clean five pounds of cotton in a day, manually, because the cotton was hard to clean, the seed from the cotton is hard to clean. So this guy came up with the idea and he, he invented what you call the cotton gin. And the cotton gin, one person in a day could clean a thousand pounds of cotton. So you know what happened? These white people, you know, they're so greedy for money. They start to get more lands because they have this um, equipment where more cotton can be cleaned. So what happens is that the areas where they used to be planting the tobacco, they decide that the land is not producing a whole lot. So they decide to move more south. So the second middle passage is when they take more than a million black people, they chain them up and sometimes they have to walk you know, more than a hundred miles to go to the next plantation that they're supposed to go and work on, where they're going to work in cotton. And that is what they call the second middle passage. And what they're saying, so many people died during the time of the second middle passage. So many people were separated. Children were separated from their parents. Husband was separated from their wife. Wife separated from, from husband. 
because they've taken all of these people from one part of the United States and they've taken them to another place because they need them to produce this great amount of cotton. The reason was business, um, specifically the cotton trade where it flourished in the state of Alabama. It flourished in Alabama, Mississippi, Louisiana. The slave population increased by an average of 27.5% per decade, demanding that entire families be relocated from plantation in the east and the upper south. Southern slave price more than triple because they need slaves to plant these cotton. The, the price of slave increase and the, it, it said here it tripled, raising from 500, 500 US dollars for slave in New Orleans in 1800 to 1800 dollars by 1860 because of this um, um, amount of cotton that they need. Slave becomes so expensive. The equivalent of 30,000 in 2005. So what they're saying, that's what, that's what I'm saying, that these people become so rich, you know, on slavery, because in, in that time, in the 1800, 1800 US dollars, the comparison to that in 2005 was 30,000 US dollars of the 3.5 million slaves working in the 15 states, slave states, in 1850. 1.8 million work in the cotton, cotton industry. So most of the people was working in the cotton industry because at that time, uh, tobacco was not producing a whole lot anymore and they were putting most of these slaves to work in the cotton industry because that is where, uh, where they were making most of their money. How about a state-by-state -state comparison? In 1860, slaves made up 57% of the population in South Carolina. Could you imagine that? In South Carolina, slave was 57% uh, percent of the population, the highest of any state in the Union. Coming in second was Mississippi at 57%, followed by Louisiana at 47%, Alabama at 45%, Florida and Georgia both at 44%. These places, they become filthy rich off, off, off from the labor of all of these slaves that they were keeping. In terms of abs absolute numbers, Virginia had the highest slave population. Virginia was a slave breeding state. They had the highest slave population of any state in the country in 1860. 490,865 slaves a year. They were, um, it, is, it is also, uh, uh, it was also the home of the Confederate um, capital, Richmond. They were breeding, according to what they're saying here, they were selling 490,000 people, selling to other states that wasn't breeding slaves at that time. A third of the slave labor were children. Children was the a third of the slave labor. From the time the child was six years old, or maybe even or earlier, they're putting them to work in the field. The, the, the mothers, young mothers, had to carry their children on their back, tie them up on their back, strap them down on their back, and going out work in the fields. And as soon as the little one can walk, and they can hold themselves up, take them out into the field, they are going to pick cotton. You know, anybody ever see cotton? Yeah. Cotton is very, it is very pitiful area. And could you imagine little children have to put their hands and they have to pick these things. Slaves didn't just work on farms. They were hired out in the trade, work in factories, and in on pairs, and men sailing ships. So they were not only working, in the field, they were working in other places, manning uh, um, uh, ships, you know, that was out there. Amen. <clears throat> they also build between 9,000 and 10,000 
miles of railroad tracks by the time the Civil War broke out. So what is happening here? These slaves, they didn't just work on their master's plantation. Master from time to time is going to hire them out. Master has about 25 slaves, and what he's going to do, probably take 10, and he hire 10 out to somebody else. And then those that remain have to pick up the slack. They have to work harder because they have less slaves on the plantation. And then he's going to make some money, extra money coming in, in his pocket because he hired out the slave. Slave breeding industry in the United States. Slave breeding is the, the focus of this history of the United States from the colonial time to the Civil War. The expansion of cotton uh, cultivation and the closing of international slave trade increased the demand for slave in the Southwest, increased the slave price throughout the United States. Here is how the American slave breeding industry work according to some state. Most importantly, Virginia, producing slaves as their main domestic crop. Could you imagine that? In Virginia, their main domestic crop is not cotton, you know, it's slave. They breed in slave, and that is their main domestic crop. The price of slave was anchored by industry in other states that consumed slaves in the production of rice and sugar and constant territorial expansion. So what they're saying here, these states that didn't have, uh, wasn't breeding slave, they are in the sugar business, they are in the cotton business, in the rice business. When the price of sugar go up, when the price of cotton go up, when the price of any of these things go up, the price of slave is going to go up. Amen. And what they were doing, they constantly, um, they said that they constantly uh, ter territorial expansion. So what the, the, the constantly territorial expansion that they're talking about here is that they need more slaves. So what they do, they keep grabbing more land from the Indians. They confiscating the lands of the Indians. Because as we read before, the Indians couldn't really walk the land. They couldn't handle the pressure. So the black people can handle the pressure. So the more they plant cotton, more the price of cotton go up, is the more land they want, and the more they confiscate in lands from the Indians, and they put in the slaves to work on these lands. As long as the slave power continued to grow, breeders could literally bank on future demand and increased prices. That made slave not just a co co uh, commodity, but the closest thing to money that white breeders had. Slave was so important to the white people back in that time. It's hardly to quantify just how valuable people were as commodity. I'm coming to an end. But the sublet, this is the person that writing about this uh, article here, tried to convey it by a conservative estimate. In 1860, the total value of American slave, listen to this, in 1860, the total value of American slave was $4 billion, far more than the gold and the silver that was circulating nationally. The amount of gold that was circulating nationally at that time, in 1860, it was $228.3 million in gold that was circulated. The price of slave back in that time was $4 billion. The, the, this post is taken further. He said most of, uh, 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 most, most of it is in the north. The author had total currency. The amount of currency that they have in circulation at that time, it was $435.4 million in currency that they have. And even the value of the South total farmland, they're talking about the total um, value of the farmland in the South, it was $1.92 billion. So if you put the amount of gold that they have and the amount of cash that they have circulated and you add the farmland to it, the, 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 the amount that the slave worked back in that time in comparison, putting all of those amount together, the slave worked 
more than all of these assets that these people have back in that time. Slave was more valuable than gold back in that time because slaves were property. Slaves were property. Southern slave owners could mortgage them to the bank and then the bank could package the mortgage into bonds and sell the bonds to any, anyone, anywhere in the world, even where slave was illegal. So what they say is that these people, they want to get a mortgage from the bank, you want to get $10,000, $20,000 from the bank, you go into the bank and the bank will ask you, how many slaves you have? They're not going to ask you about your land. They ask you, how many slaves you have? You say, well, I have 50 slaves, 50 adult slaves. And then you will say, well, I have about 25 children. Children back at that time was counted as interest. So because of the amount of slave that you have, they will give you a loan based on the amount of slave that you have. And then they will take those slaves and they will convert them to bonds. The price of the slave, the money that they give out, they convert it to bonds. And then they sell it to people in different parts of the world. In the south, there were slave breeding farms where the number of women and children uh, far outnumber the number of men. When a white man got married, his father would give him a slave woman for a cook. Anybody know anything about that? White man got married, he take his son, his son got married, he take a slave woman and he give the slave woman as a cook. And she would have children right in the house by him. And his wife would have children too. Sometimes the slave woman having child and the white uh, master's wife having child at the same time. Sometimes the cook children favor him so much that the wife would, would be mean to them and make him sell them. Because the children come out looking like master, looking like the, the children of the, the, the lawful children from the, the master, master's wife. And what he will do, the wife will force the master to sell these mulatto children because they look too much like him. And as I close, if they had nice long hair, they come up with nice long hair, she would cut it off and wouldn't let them wear it long like the white children. She would cut off their hair. Could you imagine what these children was going through? They would buy a fine girl and then a fine man and just put them together like cattle. They would not stop to marry them. If she was a good breeder, they, would, uh, they, would, they were proud of her. I was supposed to say, I was stout and they, <laughs> they were saving me for a breeding woman. But my time, <laughs> he said, but, but by the time I was big enough, I was free. So she was able to escape. I had a man in Mississippi and she had about 20 children by the master. I'm going to close here for today. I know a lot of these things that we are saying, it probably upset it to a lot of us, but all these things that I'm talking about, brothers and sisters, these things are documented in history. And uh, we can't forget about the suffering that our ancestors go through for us. And uh, we need to keep it alive. And we're not talking about these things because we want to stir up any hatred or any animosity in anybody's heart. But our, our history, we can't forget our history. Yeah. If you forget your history, if you don't know where you came from, you don't know where you're going. All right, may the Lord bless us. Anybody have any question that you'd like to ask before I close up for today? I know where you are. Any question or any comment anybody would like to ask before I close up? Amen, praise the Lord. Gracious Father, we thank you for today. Thank you, Lord, for these eye-opening information that you are making available to us. Help us, O oh God, Lord, to keep in memory our history. And know, God, that we are your people and you have paid an awesome price for our deliverance. Help us, O oh God, not to become discouraged, but help us to keep on trusting you, knowing that you will make a way where there seems to be no way. Continue to bless us, we pray. In the name of your son, Yeshua, bless the Lord. Amen.